It's my great honor to introduce Bruce Logan, the director of the Maxim Institute, which is a research and policy institute, a think tank in New Zealand, located in both Christchurch and Auckland. He's a graduate of the Universities of Auckland um, and Queensland University, and he is a um, former high school principal. He's taught in several countries, and he started the New England Educational Development Foundation in 1991, which has evolved or morphed, uh, changed, uh, developed into what is now called the Maxim Institute, which he heads. Uh, it uh, uh, believes in a free society and responsible individuals. I met Bruce five years ago when I happened to be in that corner of the world, and he very graciously invited me to participate in a conference that he was sponsoring in Auckland, which was one of the most thought-provoking one-day conferences that I've ever attended with uh, speakers from New Zealand, including himself, and from Australia, some very thoughtful uh, people addressing issues relating to the family and to the essentially the basis of a civil society. Uh, and I'll never forget the wonderful presentation I heard by Sir Michael Hardy Boys at that conference, uh, who came out of respect for Bruce and delivered just a very thoughtful paper on the essentially the basis of a civil society. Um, causing us to rethink what it is that makes a democracy work, what makes a civil society, what are the building blocks or the foundation stones, because too often we focus on structural uh, and other conceptual principles that are superstructure, but we overlook the substructure. Now, um, uh, Corey mentioned that Bruce is here attending and participating in the World Family Policy Forum. Uh, and what he didn't say was we dragged him off the podium. He literally finished speaking and then had to walk off the podium in order to get here because of a scheduling glitch that occurred after we'd made our schedule. Uh, and so we're very fortunate to have him. And our desire is, and I know that this uh, period ends at 10 minutes to 12, we invite you to mingle afterwards for 10 or 15 minutes, but we're going to need to drag him back there because they have a luncheon for, and as one of the speakers who ran out way from the question and answer period, I'm sure that there are going to be people that want to uh, follow up uh, and ask him questions about the bill that he was discussing, recent legislative developments in New Zealand. It's my honor to introduce Bruce Logan. Is there a copy of that um, national anthem? The Can I have a copy? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lynn. And it's, um, it's good fun to be here, I think. <laughs> um, thank you, great. Ah, that's what I need. Actually, Lynn's visit to New Zealand, that was a long time ago, is still reverberating. Um, he did um, some research. We used some of his research and, <laughs> and some of our social legislation, particularly in relationship to um, recent, two recent bills in New Zealand. One is the Civil Union Bill, and the other was the Prostitution Reform Bill, which legalised prostitution in New Zealand just recently. Uh, and um, some of the work he's done is still echoed. Some people, I could say, in New Zealand don't like Lynn for that reason. Others, of course, like me, do. <laughs> I'm very pleased that he was uh, we're still able to use some of his data. Now, I've started, and this is a new experience for me, by the way, coming to a university and having the lecture open in prayer. I've never been to a university <laughs> and had a talk open in prayer before. Uh, um, but that's, I'm very pleased to be able to be here and for that to happen. Now, another thing is, of course, I've left one of my critical pieces of paper behind, but I'll have to add lib it. That's okay. I can manage that. But I want to um, just give you a bit of a drift first of New Zealand, give you a flavour about the country and how much it's changed in the last few years. Now, I got to send got a, a copy of the New Zealand National Anthem. This is still our national anthem. It goes back over 100 years. And um, um, it's remarkable in that it no longer really re represents what's actually happening in Parliament. But uh, it was written by a fellow called Thomas Bracken, and it, was never, it didn't actually become officially the New Zealand National Anthem until about 25 years ago. The New Zealand National Anthem up to 25 years ago was God Save the Queen. 
um, New Zealand used to be known as the Britain of the South. It was very British. That's no longer the case. Um, we still uh, we still have great ties with Britain. In fact, our Supreme Court was the Privy Council in London until about three years ago. So now we have our own Supreme Court. So it shows you how closely our ties were, even until recently. Um, so um, this, I want to just go through a couple of, of, of um, verses of this. It's actually a hymn, which was remarkable, for a secular nation to be singing a hymn like this. Um, and it's very frequently sung in Maori, and I'll go give you some comments on that, why that's so. But um, it is also sung at um, rugby matches, for example. It's, uh, the rugby teams will always... By the way, I, I do have to let you know that the British Lions were just touring New Zealand the last two or three weeks. The British Lions is the pinnacle of British rugby. It's Ireland, Scotland, Wales and um, England all in one team. They come, they tour about every four or five years. So it's a big deal. Now, there's, rugby, of course, is a religion in New Zealand. It's also the game that's played in heaven, you know. <laughs> and um, everyone, um, in, just as another little side, would you believe that when I was a high school, playing rugby was compulsory? The only way you could not play rugby at the school that I went to was to have a doctor's certificate. <laughs> Times have changed. But anyway, um, we beat them. Three, so we had three games against them and beat them every three times. That's a lie. So I didn't need to let you know that. <laughs> um, you, you after your deployment, they would play mosques. The whole nation would have a, a prayer up. Oh, they would, yes. <laughs> yeah. They would, yes, indeed. It's, um, um, it's, I, don't know, I, I don't know how it happened in New Zealand, but rugby is sort of the... It's what everyone sort of thinks about a lot of the time. But let's have a look at this, this hymn, which um, is still, in spite of our secularised nature, and it's, God of nations at thy feet, in the bonds of love we meet. Here, I won't sing it, by the way. <laughs> Hear our voices we entreat, God defend our free land. Guard Pacific's triple star, that's a reference to the three islands of New Zealand, from the shafts of strife and war, make her praises heard afar, God defend New Zealand. Bit Victorian language, a little bit Victorian, but nevertheless, there's no there's no sort of underlying current to change this at the moment. There are attempts to change the flag, but they haven't got off the ground. Men of every creed and race, gather here before Thy face, asking Thee to bless this place. God defend our free land, and corrupt from dissension, envy, hate, and corruption. Guard our state, make our country good and great. God defend New Zealand. Um, now, I won't read the rest of the verses. You can read them yourselves. But the point I want to make is how much the origins of New Zealand were in the Christian faith. The Treaty of Waitangi in 1840 was a very enlightened treaty between the Maori and um, the European settlers. It has become problematic for a whole lot of reasons I won't bore you with now. But the important thing about that was that the Maori signed the treaty in 1840 because the missionaries were the people who translated the treaty into Maori. They also, by the way, t um, gave Maori a written language. But the, the, the Maori chiefs trusted the missionaries. And uh, they had the, the Maori abs absorbed Christianity very quickly, as Polynesian peoples tend to do, or tend to, in fact, they did. And so the Treaty of Waitangi is also rooted in an understanding of the Christian faith. Um, and it's really impossible to understand it outside that context. The, revision view, the revisionist view of history, of course, that's going on in New Zealand and around the world now, of course, is attempting to do that kind of thing. But it's, it's not really a, a very good real understanding of what actually went on. But the, the, the changing social patterns in New Zealand now and consequent legislation over recent dec decades is similar to what's going on in other nations. But New Zealand's a small country, four million people, and it has always been something of a social laboratory. And it's, it's easy to see, uh, in a big country like the United States, where similar trends are going on, um, it, they're much harder to isolate because there are so many different currents operating in a big country like this. But in New Zealand, you can see the things that are going on. And when I talk about secularisation, by the way, I'm really talking about 
the influence of postmodernism, structuralism, and uh, the, the, the writings of some of the French existentialists and so on, as they have actually spun out, undermined religious understanding, and shaped up a different nature of authority in the culture. And I'm, I'm calling it secularization because I don't have time to talk about all those other things. Now, because New Zealand is so small, we can see those, we can see those changes. Now, New Zealand, by the way, was the first country in the world to give votes to women. It's been a welfare state for a very long time. And it was once upon a time the most regulated economy in the world. Uh, it's got a very successful state education system until recently. And I know that from personal experience. I've taught in North America uh, and in England and Australia in the 60s. And in my opinion, for what it's worth, the New Zealand education system was the most innovative and least textbook dependent. I remember coming to the United States and um, Canada in the 1960s, and education in the States and in those days was very textbook dependent. American teachers had a great deal of trouble teaching outside the textbook, it seemed to me, back in those days. Whereas in those days, if you threw a New Zealand teacher a bit of chalk, he could teach, because we, were, we, we had a, a different way of looking at things. Things have changed, but we did have a good education. And our education system isn't bad, but it is suffering the inroads of um, secularisation. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. The, the economy was deregulated in, in the 1980s, um, and um, we got rid of all our tariffs and subsidies, and the country just about went to the wall in the 1980s and, and, and in terms of economics. But um, we became a very f um, open economic, and we still are an open economy, uh, to a very large extent, and that was uh, that was out of necessity. We're way ahead of um, um, President Bush and his desire for getting rid of subsidies that he was talking about in um, Scotland just recently. And ju so, during the 1950s and 60s, New Zealand enjoyed one of the highest standards of living in the world. And by the but, but by the 1970s, a well-developed welfare state. Almost 90% of the population back in then would have claimed some kind of Christian affiliation. Today, I suppose, if you well, the census says about 60% of people identify as some kind of Christian, but on any Sunday you'll only find something like 5 to 10% of people in church, uh, um, uh, which is more realistic. Now, until recently, New Zealand has been politically socialist but culturally conservative. That is, th because we're a welfare state. And that's because egalitarianism in New Zealand has a long history. Egalitarianism um, is sort of part of the New Zealand identity. It was a, it was it was it's a, it was a country where the gap between rich and poor was very small. Uh, until but that gap's widened, and widened, got wider and wider now. But egalitarianism was part of our psyche, and we used to we had phrases, you know, things like "give a bloke a fair go." In other words, there was they were more intuitive than philosophically coherent, but they were part of of what and and we were um, because we were a small nation isolated, we were pretty adaptable and innovative in that in that sort of way. And in, in 1938, in fact, the Prime Minister of the day, Michael Joseph Savage, talked about the inalienable right of every person to be secured against distress in any form. And he saw that as the role of the state to do that. Remarkable thing for a politician to say in 1938. So, but now we're living out the consequences of that in our faith and in our uh, culture. And I suppose we're living out a sort of godless Christianity um, in New Zealand. It's interesting to observe that New Zealand was settled during the lifetime of some very significant atheists. And the first chancellor of Canterbury University was a very outspoken atheist. Um, but people like George Eliot, Charles Darwin, Marx and Freud were all alive when New Zealand was being settled. And that kind of intellectual ferment was to some extent planted in New Zealand even in its early days. And it was a classless society. Um, and it still is largely a classless society, although um, parliament, um, parliamentarians are very accessible. It's very easy to talk to parliamentarians. Uh, I could even, if I wanted to, although probably I couldn't because I'm the director of the Maxim Institute and the government hates us in New Zealand. <laughs> but under normal circumstances, I might be able to talk to the Prime Minister. I can certainly talk to a lot of MPs. So we're pretty accessible. 
Now, what I mean by secularism in New Zealand and what I call the progress of secularism in New Zealand, it's a kind of, I think it's a kind of model for what's going on around the world. Now, secularism, you can call it, um, I call it the new paganism, if you like, and it displays itself in a number of ways. One is the abandonment of philosophy and the abandonment of any kind of theology to underpin our thinking. Um, it really is simple um, old postmodernism from Marx to Foucault. It represents that kind of feeling. It might be sometimes called enlightened rationalism. Some people might like to call it that. Some might people like to call it bold atheism. I think it even has elements of pantheism. And certainly in New Zealand, there is a kind of pantheistic element going through. And I'll illustrate these things in a minute, uh, going through our education system right now. Um, and the, the, the simple liberal media, which is disconnected from history. I was going to read, which I've left behind over there. I write for the different newspapers from time to time in New Zealand. I've just written one on what I called um, the two popes. Um, it was about, we have a, um, a very outspoken minister of um, education called Benson Pope in New Zealand. Uh, and um, New Zealand has just been recently criticised by the Pope for its civil union bill. And um, Benson Pope, who's um, just got into trouble in New Zealand Parliament for, he used to be a school teacher, and he got into trouble in New Zealand Parliament for allegedly putting tennis balls in students' mouths to stop them from talking. <laughs> now, the, you, this was a debate that went on in the New Zealand media. How do you get a tennis ball into a student's mouth? Tennis ball's too big to get in the mouth. But you see, what he used to have it on, <laughs> he had it on a, a stick, on an arrow, and there's a hole in the ball which punctured, you see. And he, it, it did, it, this actually did come out in Parliament. And he was the Minister of Education, so he had to step down from being Minister of Education. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Um, um, he, um, having to defend the fact that he had actually done this, he had, he had deflated the ball, put it into the student's mouth, and of course it had gone up again, and he couldn't get it out. It caused all kinds of trouble. So um, the irony in this is quite remarkable. Now, secularism, I would argue, in New Zealand is a parasite. It rejects the plant in which it feeds. Like, for example, in human rights legislation, there is an assumption that, uh, there is, that human beings have dignity. But if you've got a secularised version of human rights, and by the way, you know when you look at the Human Rights Declaration, the 1948 Declaration, and you look at the various drafts of it, you will see the process of secularisation going on in those various drafts. Because originally... Some of the material was actually quite religious in nature when you look at it and you look at the whole notion of where human dignity comes from. I mean, where does the notion of human dignity come from? Where do you, how do you identify and gain what it means to be dignified? Well, the Christian answer, of course, is very clear. Um, human beings have dignity because they've been created in God's image. But if that's not the case, where do human beings get their dignity from? Well, the only other solution, of course, is from the state. Because the state, either we get our dignity from something transcendent of the state or else the state supplies us with it. And one of the things that I would argue about a secularised state is we are in danger of losing the grounds of our freedom. And the role of priest and king tend to get wrapped up into one little heap. Because what happens is um, um, one, of the, one of the great contributions of the Christian faith to liberal democracy and creating liberal democracy has been, of course, that notion of human dignity and the idea of a foundation of law above the state. But when you get rid of that notion, then the state as an authority replaces, replaces God. Now, that might sound an oversimplistic way of looking at it, but nevertheless, I think it does boil down to that. And so secularized, a secular... A secularised society, as opposed to a secular society, actually acts as a parasite. It, it has these notions of human dignity, but it doesn't recognise the origin of where dignity comes from. And so um, dignity then depends on the state for support and enforcement. And I think this is becoming evident in New Zealand, because what's happening in New Zealand is the public morality is being shaped by the state. See, when you, get, when you get prostitution law reform like we've recently had in New Zealand, the state is saying that prostitution is legitimate and a legal phenomenon. Now, it's not saying it's moral, but nevertheless, that does tend to follow in the minds of the citizens. 
And if you have the state also rejigging the nature of marriage in the Civil Union Bill that's just passed recently in New Zealand, then you also have the state. By the way, both of these bills were passed in New Zealand with overwhelming opposition. Something like 80 and 90 per cent of the submissions made to government were against both of these bills. But the government still went ahead and did it because they were driven by a secularist ideology of um, protecting minorities and a, um, a, a human rights legislation which is based on group identity and so on. We have also got coming out now a gender identity bill. New Zealand, of course, is the f well, not of course, but New Zealand is the first country in the world to have a transgender member of parliament. I don't know what toilet he goes to. But, um, um, and she, or he, I mean, the thing is, we, uh, he was, his, his name is Georgina Beyer, he's in the Labour Party, and it, 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 he's identified as a woman. In fact, we had him, um, um, recently you had him in the States too, um, Dancing with the Stars, was it Dancing with the Stars you had here? Something like that, Dancing with Celebrities or something like that. We had a Dancing with the Stars, and he was the w partner for one of he, he was or she was a female partner for one of the um, one of the people in the TV. It was very interesting, but it shows you the, the the cultural shift and the way public sensitivities are being changed by the law, which is the point I'm making here. And anyway, um, Georgina um, has introduced a gender identity bill into Parliament, a private member's gender identity bill, which might be taken up by the lay, which is about making giving um, people who are transgender or who are what do you, um, who have had their gender changed, people in between, people who have had their gender changed, all being given status as, as ident given human rights identity. I see puzzled looks on the faces as how could this happen, but it is happening. Because you see, once you lose contact with the notion of human dignity, you see the point is that well, is that in, built into the notion of human dignity is the creation of male and female. This is, you know, I'm talking about the biblical notion of human dignity. God created male, he created female. We have two sexes. One way to destroy that kind of foundation is to confuse us about the nature of sex. First of all, to introduce a word like gender, for example, instead of sex, to, to call it. And then, of course, you invent all kinds of different genders. And so we have... In effect, the law, if this bill is passed in New Zealand, will identify five genders, all of which will be protected by human rights legislation. And that, I would argue, is a consequence of secularisation. Now, so beneath the covers, we've had all this going on. We've had this historical fat infatuation with egalitarianism, a fair go for the average bloke, that the eventual disconnection between religion and morality and the consequent change in the nature of authority... When morality is disconnected from religion, you must get a change in the nature of authority in a culture. That must follow. And one of the things that, that um, in, in, Western, in the Western world has been this, uh, this identity of morality arising out of religion, we've understood that, which has given us the separation of church and state, not to be confused in New Zealand, we frequently confuse the separated, separation of church and state with the separation of religion and politics. People say, oh, we shouldn't have religion and politics. What they really mean is that the institutions of church and state should be separate. That's quite different from the intrusion or the, because religion and politics, of course, do go together. But when that no longer happens, the authority moves away from the citizen towards the state. And that's why one of the reasons why families are so important. I mean, a lot of reasons why families are so important. I know at this university it's significant, very significant, but one of the reasons why family is important is because they are the mediating institution between the individual and the state. And one way to transfer the nature of power is to destroy the family or to undermine the family because then you naturally get a transference of power to the state. That must happen. And so if you, have, if you were in the business of dictatorship, like they were in the Soviet Union and Marxism, one thing you had to do was to destroy the family, which, of course, is what radical feminism does as well, is to undermine the family. And now, the thing about that is it changes the nature of authority. The question is you're always going to have a boss. The question is who's going to be your boss, really. Now, now, some things 
have been going on in New Zealand, which are quite interesting, to illustrate how in a secularised nation, by the way, I should identify the difference between a secular nation and a secularised nation. When I talk about a secular nation, I'm quite happy with a secular nation. That is, a nation where it is religiously neutral, if that's possible, but as religiously neutral as possible, allows religious freedom and allows the church to go about its business of informing the public ethic. But a secularised nation is the imposition of a secularised morality and a secularised ideology on the citizen, which is developed and run by the state. And that's what I'm arguing is what's happening in New Zealand now. For example, our Prime Minister, um, Helen Clark, said that, um, uh, well, not before that, the person who was uh, initiated the Civil Union Bill was a very outspoken homosexual in New Zealand. And he also initiated the Prostitution Reform Bill. It's astounding, really. I mean, it's absolutely astounding. Um, and New Zealanders are only just starting to catch up with this. Um, but anyway, he described the Civil Union Bill as a pragmatic middle ground solution, sidestepping the divisive issue of same-sex marriage. He said it would be an opportunity to pioneer a new 21st century expression of commitment free from religious or traditional presumptions. I'll read you that again. He said it would be an opportunity to pioneer a new 21st century expression of commitment free from religious or traditional presumptions. Astounding thing to say, but nevertheless that's the mood of the time that he can say that and people say, oh yeah. So that's what I mean by a secularised society where we don't really understand the nature of our history and the nature of our freedoms and the origins of our freedoms. Now the Prime Minister at a state banquet in, 19, in 2002 for the Queen when she was visiting New Zealand said New Zealand is now a secular country and grace would not be said at the meal. Now on marriage the Prime Minister has also said I felt really compromised. I think legal marriage is unnecessary and I would not have formalised the relationship with husband Peter Davies except that I wanted to go into Parliament. I have always railed against it privately and asked if she thought getting married was a bad idea. Miss Clark said it was a necessary evil. In the same context, um, um, rugby, of course, is a big deal in New Zealand, as I said. The other big deal is yachting in New Zealand. We're pretty good at it. We have, we've had the America's Cup twice, but you probably don't know. This part inland, you know what the America's Cup is? This part <laughs> in inland? Some do. Some do. The America's Cup is a cup that was originally um, fought over between the British and American, the, Amer the New England states, and it became known as the America's Cup. America held it for about 100 years. New Zealand took it off them about oh, 10 or 11 years ago. Then they got it back and we got it back again. But it's now, I bet you don't know who owns the who's got the Americas. The Swiss have, for goodness sake. With the New Zealand team. With the, yeah, with the New Zealand team. Uh, anyway, that's by the way. But just, I just want to let you know that we do the odd thing here and there. Um, and in that context of the America's Cup, we gave a lot of money to, the government gave a lot of money to the, the, the team New Zealand, which was... And there was a bit of contention about that. And she said in that context, the government's role was whatever the government defined it to be. Which is interesting. Now the point I'm making here is that secularism run rampant, you find people saying very silly things and not being held up, not being brought to task. There's an election coming up in September, which I think is probably the most important election we've ever had in New Zealand. If the present government goes back, New Zealand will become the most secularised the most legally secularised nation in the world, I suspect. If it doesn't go back, then we may have some years of um, reprieve. At the moment, the opposition is running two or three points ahead in the polls. So maybe we might just make it. Maybe we just might make it by the skin of our teeth. When is the election? September this year. I just at Maxim Institute, by the way, our, we've been lobbying very hard. Um, in a whole lot of areas and we're having a lot of success with the opposition that's the Conservative Party in New Zealand well, who's, who's the, who are the, the people the, 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 the leader of the opposition is Don Brash oh, right. yeah he used to be the um, 
director of the Reserve Bank. No, he's a um, he's a Presbyterian. Yeah, uh, he's got he's he's certainly um, much more conservative than Helen Clark, but then anybody is. Um, my daughter, by the way, has just been giving a talk over and across there called New Zealand, the first feminist nation. I haven't got time to talk about that, but um, <laughs> um, New Zealand, the Governor General of New Zealand. Now, this I should make this point here. I've got no problem with women being in positions of power is in, in Parliament, but it's what kind of woman we've got in New Zealand. We've got the Prime Minister is a woman, the Governor General is a woman, the Attorney General is a woman, the Chief Justice is a woman, the Minister of Health is a woman, and the Minister of Education. Oh no, yes, the Minister of Education. The thing is, three of them are lesbians. Uh, the Prime Minister probably is as well. Her prime advi her first advisor is. And if you go back to um, their history, back about. 30 years ago, they were in the Socialist Action Union and they were designing it all then. So it's what you can do if you really want to do something in a country. I'm giving you a very potted version of it, but nevertheless. Now, in the context of what's been going on in the secularisation, is that we have a whole lot of bad social indicators. For example, in 1975 in New Zealand, we had 5% of people on welfare. Last year, 23% of um, New Zealanders were getting some kind of welfare payout. Um, in 1970, we had one person in welfare for 28 workers. Today, we've got one person in welfare for four workers. Now, see, one of the consequences, I would argue, of secularisation is an increasing dependence on the state. Um, and that, that seems to be inevitable. And we've, got, we've lost a whole lot of concept. We have... Um, a fixation with human rights. Now, there's just two things, points I want to make to just illustrate something. In education, something very interesting is happening in New Zealand. Um, when you've got a secular government or a secularised government, how does it get, how does it get um, when it does its public, um, big public, open, like opening a building or launching a ship or doing something like that, where does it get its ritual from? Having rejected Christianity, see, in the old days, we, um, if, if, if you had a, a big deal on, you would have a minister of religion or uh, the, art, the bishop or someone to come along and bless whatever it was. And it, was sort of, it would give the, the, the thing a kind of ritual that was deserving of the importance of the event. I mean, all cultures do it. It's part of what cultures do. But now having rejected Christianity, what do you do? What does a secularised state do? Well, what a secularised state does is what it's doing in the schools. It takes the, the indigenous Maori religion, the spirituality of the indigenous Maori religion, because it has got no ethic going with it and uses that to its own ends. And so that um, you get um, in the schools, for example, one of the most obvious illustrations of the need for a secularised society to embrace a spiritual aspect because human beings are spiritual creatures. So you've got to find it somewhere. So you find it in Maori religion in New Zealand. Now, it can be found in the health and physical education curriculum in, in, the, New um, in the New Zealand curriculum. Right in the New Zealand curriculum, now being taught in state schools, which were supposed to be secular schools, we now have spiritual well-being being taught in the schools. And spiritual well-being is the values and beliefs that determine the way people live, the search for meaning and purpose in life. The pers this is straight from our education ministry. And personal identity and self-awareness. For some individuals and communities, spiritual well-being is linked to a particular re religion. For others, it is not. But it is identified as taha wāru, which, of course, is making use of Maori, the Maori religion. Secularism is a confused and ambiguous dogma, I'd argue, and in the curriculum statement, this curriculum statement here, this is evident in spiritual well-being. Now, the conceptual framework is said to rest on an internationally recognised concept of total well-being, which is just New Age babble, really. But this is actually a curious mix of politics, environmentalism, consequentialist ethics, relativism, and a strange esoteric spirituality wrapped up in Oranga na kaka, which means this huge, insightful, and penetrating piece of wisdom 
positive feelings in your heart will raise your sense of self-worth. Now, this extraordinary vacuous claim is the animating proverb of the entire curriculum. And so spirituality, so secularism finishes up with accepting a kind of mindless esoteric spirituality in order to give it some kind of prestige. And so team, in that area, it tends to disappear into itself in a sort of a sentimentalised twaddle. So the problem with secularism, and I'll finish because you want some time for questions, um, is that as it's operating in New Zealand, it doesn't really have a philosophy for the nature of the person. It doesn't really articulate what it means to be human, and that's one of its great problems. It has no notion of human dignity, and it's consistently utopian. It's always promising a better world soon down the road, which will be developed and manufactured by the state. It has got no way to attend to the problem of evil. And ultimately, any kind of compelling morality has to be derived from the state. And so secularism becomes coercive. It becomes coercive in its morality. And ultimately, there's no way of separating the role of priest from the role of king. You know, if you go back to Roman times, one of the problems with tyranny in Roman times, and indeed in the Soviet Union, if you wrap up the role of priest and king into one, who do you appeal to when the state puts you in jail for some kind of... because then the state becomes absolute. And for hundreds of years, one of the great contributions to Western freedom has been, been that separation of the priest and king, having two particular areas of sovereignty. And now we are eroding them because secularism as a concept does erode them because it erodes the religious nature of the culture in which Western, the Western world and indeed New Zealand was, is dependent upon. Now, I'm sorry that was a bit rushed, but you've got a few ideas there um, that um, might have sort of given you some idea of what's going on in New Zealand. So... Um, Oh, sure. Well, yeah, the, the, we, we, well, we do, we're supposed to have checks and balances. We do have a, I mean, we have a, a cabinet and we have parliament and we have the courts and there's supposed to be is some kind. But the problem is that um, the cabinet really runs the country. And by the cabinet, I mean the ministers of government really run the country rather than parliament. And that's the, that's, that's the way the process, that's the way the Westminster parliamentary system has e evolved in... Um, in, in New Zealand, and so that the separation of powers, even in the United States, I would think, is uh, under very serious threat if you lose your connection with the religious nature of the citizenry. Because if, 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 if the citizens have a certain responsibility to maintain vigilance, and that vigilance is dependent upon their virtue, which is ultimately their religious consciousness, and if that's lost, then um, I, I think even in the United States, the separation of powers would become problematic. That's the truth. Yes, of course, you said that what this vision was like that I worship the teachers of Jesus who tried to bring this back mm. in church. Uh, and I know you've said that. How do you <coughs> explain 
Well, very happy with that, having been able to say the same thing. Yeah, but I don't think, I, I think, just to go back to what the lady down the back was saying about the moral stick, I think we're, we're living off our inheritance of our grandparents from the Second World War. We're, what we've got is a residual sort of freedom, which is consequential to what has gone before us. But when any, any generation has got to put back into the culture um, their understanding of what's done that, you know, and we're not doing that any better. And in the Western world, I, I, I mean, if you go back to 17th century England or 18th century England, when um, uh, things were very bad socially, Methodism came along and had a religious revival which shaped and rechanged and rejigged the whole of New Zealand and the whole of Britain and was really influential in shaping America, the great American experiment. So short of a religious revival in the West or a reformation of some kind, I don't think there is any real way forward. I mean, if we look at Europe, for example, at the moment, one of the problems in Europe is that um, the Europeans threatened with the advance of Islam uh, have a real problem because they've got no cultural competence. If you absorb the whole notion of cultural relativism, how do you defend your own culture against an aggressor, a cultural, I mean, an intellectual or religious aggressor? And that's what's tending to happen in Europe. You know. The French and the Germans are having that kind of problem. Because, and, and the Dutch might be waking up to it a bit, but um, um, if, if you've lost confidence, Reformation in Europe, or some kind of return to their roots, I don't think they'll resist the inroads of Islam in the West. Yeah, I bring you back to what you mentioned about uh, the UN. I should say to the British who went to war, you know, there are lots of tables of knowledge I have learned from that, and you have spelled them all out <laughs> for an American yeah. from Bobo Musa, Willie Mayer, Loretta Kennedy, to the yeah. great. Single mother and the welfare of Britain. It's got to be the same. Yeah, that's certainly problematic. We're not gutted yet, but certainly it's a problem. It's certainly a problem.